Look at this poor branch. It's so thirsty. If this branch was still attached to its plant, how would the plant know how much water to take into its roots by osmosis when it's wilted like this? What factors affect the rate of osmosis? This is osmosis. All living things need a way to make sure there is enough water available to maintain homeostasis and perform normal cell functions, such as respiration and nutrient uptake. Water is so important for normal cell function that cell membranes not only allow water molecules to go right through the membrane without additional energy input, but cells also have special embedded protein channels called aquaporins, whose only job is to allow water to move in and out of a cell at a rate faster than simple diffusion when cells need to exchange water very quickly. Today, we are going to investigate how fast water moves across a semi-permeable membrane when the concentration of a dissolved solute is different on either side of the membrane. The process of a solvent such as water moving from an area of low solute concentration to high solute concentration is called osmosis. This is a model of a cell filled with solutes. The tightly sealed dialysis bag represents a cell a membrane because the bag is semi-permeable like a cell membrane, which keeps the dissolved solutes inside the cell separate from outside of the cell. The solution inside the bag is pancake syrup. This syrup is a solution made of sugar and water. Sugar is the solute and water is the solvent. You can see that the bag is closed around this piece of tubing, which I will attach to a pressure sensor. In a minute, I'm going to put the cell in the beaker of distilled water, which represents extracellular fluid. Assume there are no solutes and only water in the beaker. Since there is a difference in solute concentration between the cell and the extracellular fluid, we know water will have an overall movement from one side of the membrane to the other. When I put the bag in the beaker, water will move back and forth through the membrane, but the pressure sensor will help us understand which direction water is moving overall. That is what I'm going to call the net movement of water. If water has a net movement into the bag, that air space will shrink and the pressure will increase. If water has a net movement out of the bag, the air space will get bigger and pressure will decrease. We can also make qualitative observations of the bag and beaker contents before and after the bag is placed in the water. Right now the water is clear and the contents of the bag look like ordinary pancake syrup. Now we're ready to start collecting data. First, let's get the mass of the bag system. Record the syrup bag mass in table one. The mass is 15.89 grams. I've already connected the pressure sensor in Sparkview, and now I'm going to add a little air to the bag and connect the sensor to the tubing. I'm gonna turn on the magnetic stirrer, start collecting data, and then lower the bag into the beaker, being careful not to let the magnet hit the bag. Data collection will take 15 minutes, so we'll fast forward data collection for you. I'm going to stop collecting data. And now we can record the final mass for the syrup bag in table one. I'm going to turn off the magnetic stir. Let me dry the bag and get as much water off as possible. Uh oh, it turned on. 
here. The mass is 17.13 grams. And now we're going to do another run with just distilled water in bag so you can see how mass and pressure compare when there are no solutes inside the bag. So I need a second to take off this older bag with the syrup in it. And I have the same volume of distilled water in this bag. I need to clean the tubing in case there's any syrup stuck on it. Okay, I'm going to dry it. We attach bag to the tubing. Need to seal with some tape. And some strain. Going to get the mass. And the mass is about 13.33 grams. I need a new beaker of water. Then I will add air to the bag and connect the sensor to the tubing and start data collection and then start the magnetic stir and lower the bag into the beaker. Be careful to not get the magnet to hit the bag. And data collection will continue for 15 minutes, so we will fast forward through data collection for you. It's been 15 minutes, so I'm going to stop collecting data. And now you can record the final mass of the water bag in table one. I'm going to turn off the magnetic stirrer. I'm going to retrieve the bag. I'm going to dry the bag as much as possible. to record the mass. The 
and the mass is 13.13 .13 grams. Let's move on to analysis. In Table 1, you will need to record initial and final pressure for each run. Use the coordinate tool in SparkView to help you get these values from the data. These are XY coordinates, so the first value is time, and the second value is pressure in kilopascals. I can click and drag the gray box to move it to initial and final data points on each run. Notice how both runs are checked in the legend. I can hide or make a run visible by checking the box in the legend. If I want to get coordinates from the syrup run, I need to make sure the red box is around that run. When you use any of the SparkView tools, make sure the red box is on the run you're interested in. To view both runs at full scale at the same time, make sure both runs are checked and then hit the scale button. As you already know, plants have rigid cell walls. That's good news for a plant that lives in overly moist soil. Without cell walls acting like a barrier, water might not stop moving into the solute-filled plant cells and the plant cells could burst from taking in too much water. Then again, remember how that thirsty plant I had at the beginning of this video wilted in response to too little water intake. It's a good thing plant cells can rely on osmosis to help maintain water balance and homeostasis. Now that you have all the information you need, it's time for you to complete the lab. Good luck.